Good evening, and thank you to everyone for joining us from all around the globe tonight. Even Good amongst evening. the that are here, there are several continents represented. My name is Alan Marchmont, and I started this initiative when the show that I was rehearsing in Dutch National Opera was cancelled just the day before we went to the public premiere. Um, it felt like a guillotine had really been brought down on the production and I was also held in the Netherlands due to my contract. So a way to combat the feeling of being completely alone and isolated was to write a Facebook post to, to my friends to see whether anyone was interested in creating something remotely over this time. I was actually so surprised when within 24 hours over 200 people had written to me. And it was at that point that I realised that Opera Harmony was something that had the potential to really unite people over this time. Um, half a year later, I, I mean, I could not have expected what had happened in that in this time. There's been some incredible creators that have contributed to this, and I can't begin to thank them all individually. Also, the support of Opera Europa now released 20 operas, which is nearly four hours of new content that's been created with several thousand miles of between individual team members. It's been quite a special and unique process for all of us. We've been learning as we've been going which is very unusual um, and tonight we're joined by some of them and the wonderful opera critic and music journalist Hugo Shirley. Thank you from me to all of our participants and now over to you Hugo. Well, uh, and I'm delighted to be here with all you guys to talk about the evening project. project. Um, um, first of all I just want to say a little bit about, about how the conversation is going to work um, we're going to have a bit of a refresher first, where we're going to show eight um, clips of the a clip each for for the operas that are represented by members of the panel. Um, there'll be a quick thirty second clip followed by a brief introduction by those representing um, that particular opera, and then we'll get on to the the conversation. Um, so, first of all, we'll have this quick refresher, um, and I'll hand over to, um, well, we start with uh, Auschwitz lovers. Hi, my name is Franco Pomponi. I was uh, part of the Auschwitz Lovers, one of the singers in the cast. Uh, Auschwitz Lovers was written, uh, the music and libretto was written by Philip Hollicky. Um It's uh, directed by Robert Hersey and, and uh, the cast included Susie Buckle, Carolyn Dobbin and Roger Peterson with uh, Duncan Honeyborn on piano. Um, it's from a New York Times article uh, in 2019 called Lovers in Auschwitz about uh, Helen Spitzer and David Wisnia. Uh, uh, they were both um, uh, in Auschwitz and um, cr had this month, uh, uh, several month long love affair where they would meet once a month and, and uh, and she ended up saving his life many times um, over that period. And uh, Philip wrote this incredibly amazing 10 minute piece that uh, encapsulated a lot of the power and, and beauty of that story. And uh, I was really, I was really uh, pleased to be a part of it. It's, it's beautiful music. Philip's uh, lyricism uh, was just a joy to sing. Super odd. My hands have super power. Super sold gold. Now she tells a huge girl. They scream and then they melt. They wash away like rain. The day to cross again.
Hello everyone, I hope you can hear me. So my name is Christopher Schlechter-Bond and I'm the composer of what you just saw, um, The Den, which was a fun new micro-opera featuring two kids, Amy and Joe, who are secretly hiding out in their mum's attic, imagining themselves as superheroes and cooking up a plan to defeat King Corona and the evil super spreaders. So we see them throughout the opera, trying to understand and often misinterpreting this new COVID world with a mum downstairs that's gone cleaning mad and is having a mental breakdown at the same time. So for this, I worked with Fiona Williams, who was the writer, and Jen McGregor, which was the director, and the wonderful Britt Hewitt, who filmed herself playing Joe whilst in Texas, but also Jennifer Clark, who filmed herself playing Amy whilst in Hertfordshire. So we had a bit of a almost peep show-esque kind of dynamic going on here, where we were trying to give the impression of them both being in the same room and I'm quite proud of myself for that um, so as you can hear I wrote a quite a fun and light-hearted score full of children's instruments and lots of percussion using objects that you can find in the house um, to get across the sense of the score feeling very homemade as if we were really locked in the house as we were as we were all in lockdown at the time so we also had contributions from musicians in Turkey, Sweden and Scotland. So it was a really international endeavour and it was it was great fun to make. Yeah, really lighthearted and really fun. It was here, Black Death came and took life so swiftly. I'm Candace Evans. I'm the director and librettist for Wisdom of Stone, which is the clip that you just saw, which was filmed on location in the Chateau de la Roche Lambert in the Auvergne region of France, which turned out to be the wonderful inspiration for the piece for me. Um, Ella had put me together with an extraordinary, extraordinary composer, Rose Miranda Hall. And we had a preliminary Zoom meeting with the soprano, Anne-Sophie Duprel, whose family is connected with that chateau. And in the conversation, it became clear that the piece um, was a gift from the chateau. It is built on troglodyte caves and has stood through the ages and seen the plague over and over and over again. And so I wrote the libretto to that end that we all are enclosed, but the walls around us are indeed our fortress of stone, teaching us with wisdom. Uh, we were also all over the world. I'm in Texas. Uh, Rose is in England, Aunt Sophie in France, as I said, musicians all over Europe. And we edited here at the Plush Room Studio, which um, a, a wink to my husband, who was sound and film engineer. Uh, we did all the pieces filmed by Anne-Sophie's husband and daughter, who were brilliant. Um, it was based on a storyboard, because I've never seen the interior of the chateau, Anne-Sophie sent me a Google document with about 300 pictures of locations, which I then broke down into, try this, try this, try this. And uh, through the wonders of cyberspace, we communicated and, and pulled together a piece that means a great deal to me. What was I supposed to do? Nobody had it, nobody knew. Hungry mentally, hungry physically, hungry spiritually. I can't help, I can't touch. Thank you, Ella Marchman, brilliant artistic visionary, Hugo Luke, Opera Vision, Opera Europa, and Opera Harmony for this exciting opportunity. Essential Business is a 10 minute story packed with a roller coaster of emotions and asks a universal question in the pandemic era. What do we do when everything we've ever known changes in an instant? 
conceived from across the ocean by Anna Poole and me, joined by Alais Ismael. It's inspired by real world events. We witness a pastor's conversation with God as he wrestles with his gift of faith healing, touch healing, a paradoxical asset in COVID times. And I was honored to serve as the composer, the pianist, instrumentalist, and filmmaker production person. Incidentally, all the Zoom effects were created in post-production here in my home studio. Our extraordinary baritone, Will Liverman, did not actually record on Zoom, nor was God using his Zoom account that we know of. <laughs> so the pastor reaches out to God, humbled, questioning, gets into a tussle, grapples with spirituality, it evolves into desperation and passionate intensity. And in a pivotal moment, we learn that his daughter is on life support and the pastor begs for God's loving touch. I tried to design the harmonic and stylistic framework to parallel the arc of the story as we move through a variety of musical styles, gospel, operatic, blues, musical theater. And we feel that essential business is kind of a microcosm of the societal lockdown dilemma. Humans crave connection, we're pack animals, isolation can be devastating. To what extent do we take risks to mitigate these challenges? And how do we embrace and navigate both faith and science when there are life and death consequences? Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Mary Birnbaum, and I was the director and librettist, uh, co-director and librettist, along with um, Anna Poole, who also co-directed Apartmental, with music by composer Ken Steen. It was inspired by Rear Window and a long stare-off between me and a neighbor one Tuesday afternoon, and it grew out of our conversations of the of the people uh, discussions of the people we unknowingly share our lives with and the secrets that they hold. When the visual artist Jojo Carlin sent me puppet characters uh, for each of the characters in our opera, um, our visual aesthetic was born. And it was a remedy for how to film a cast who live across the world, from Hong Kong to Peru. Ken Steen had created imaginative music and foley in order to ensconce each apartment in a unique sound world. This piece asks, what leads to trust in a community? What incentive do we have to take care of one another? And how many times can you disinfect a doorknob? The cast was all throughout the world. Uh, Gilda Lyons as Sophia, Will Liverman, Anna Lorenzo, Vivian Yao from Hong Kong, Santiago Pizarro, who's in Peru, Jalen Simmons, Brett Hewitt, Benjamin Rausch, and Rianne Bryce, Bryce Davis all across the US. Um, on electric guitar, we had Thomas Shuttenhelm, violin, we had Anton Miller, Rita Porfiris on vi viola, and the lever harp, Haley Hewitt. Um, and lastly, the puppet designer was Jojo Carlin. Thank you, Ella, and everybody at Opera Vision and Opera uh, Europa for this amazing, amazing opportunity to share something crazy that we made in quarantine with over 35,000 viewers, many of whom are trolling us on YouTube currently. Hello, um, my name is Daisy Bolton and I uh, uh, made Edge of Time, I wrote the song um, and it's inspired by a book called A Woman on the Edge of Time, which is about a woman called Hannah Gavron and the book is written by her son Jeremy Gavron. Um, and it's a son's search for his mother. Um, Hannah was a leading sociologist and pioneer for early feminism. Uh, in the 1960s and tragically committed suicide aged 29 years old um, in 1965. And um, this, this whole book is Jeremy's, the, Hannah's son's search for maybe the reasons that played into 
why why this woman uh, did what she did. So the the song kind of just follows that and explores that. Um, I worked with the wonderful Ella Marchmont, um, who actually brought the project to me in the first place. She directed it. Um, I we were actually already working in a in a lockdown sense pre lockdown. So I'd written the song just before I was in LA recording it my music producer and arranger was in London and Ella was on an opera in the Netherlands and so then lockdown happened and we went let's make a whole film <laughs> of this thing and um and I took the phone and so I shot the, shot it on my phone and performed it um and then worked with an amazing choreographer Joe Meredith so we did this final bit on the beach um and I managed to get hold of a young videographer in the village where I was holed up with my parents uh, with two hours notice who came down to the beach and got very wet and cold filming um, and then we got this amazing bunch of women that we between us reached out to to be part of the female army and Ella is in fact part of the female army um, to kind of bring this sense of women coming together moving forward so out of something really quite exceptional this book and looking into this this, this this tragic story, but very inspiring story of this woman who was just fighting and trying to come through the, you know, her, on her edge of time. Um, there's still work to be done now and women kind of coming together and inspiring that is the kind of strongest message I think of the song. Thank you so much, Ella, and thank you so much, Opera Vision. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, my name's Harry Sever and I'm a composer and conductor um, and I wrote this piece called uh, La Solitudine um, with words by Suzanne Lemieux and uh, directed by Julia Giammona um, and it stars Esther Mallet uh, as a soprano and it's for sort of multi-layered voices and uh, electronics um, and it tells the story of four people uh, escaping a kind of imaginary post-apocalyptic society um, that that was part of the first section that you saw which is this kind of frantic race to 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 run away from something we're not really sure what um, uh, and the second section is is the the isolation that they discover and the opportunity it affords them to look at themselves in the mirror um, and examine their way of life and uh, how they lived before this uh, big change, which I think I'm sure we can all associate with. Um, we were writing from three different towns. Uh, Julia was in Germany, um, I was in London, and Suzanne was out of London. Um, and it was really a response to Suzanne's words. Um, and, uh, yeah, just a really exciting process of of uh, of working in very different places and and with very different backgrounds so yeah we we all really enjoyed it i think and and looking forward to hearing more from all of you so many people everyone my name is Freya and I am a director and singer and uh, was delighted to uh, bring Walk Out of Yourselves to everybody through my company The Voicings Collective um, and uh, when Ella posted this opportunity I actually asked if we could use it as a chance to uh, create some work with our company which is in, in its infancy but is a company that's been created uh, to explore the possibilities of devising new work in the ensemble so um, it's an 
interdisciplinary group uh, and it was co-founded by myself, by Michael Betridge, the composer, and by Rebecca Hurst, the writer and librettist. Um, and in our ensemble, uh, you see Robert Gilden, um, who's baritone, and Robin Landy. And we're also joined by Beatrice Hubble uh, on oboe for this piece. And um, yeah, Voicings Collective wants to make new work where we dismantle the hierarchies of composer and librettist creating. So using some of theatre's approaches to make sure everyone in the room has an equal say um, in creating work. And then the three of us, Michael, Rebecca and myself, um, help curate and shape that and turn that into something uh, something more. And that's how we created Walk Out of Yourself. And um, for this little piece, when lockdown hit and we all found ourselves without much of the work that we were expecting over the summer, we decided it was a great opportunity to, to make something um, for ourselves and to further our, the work that we've been doing. And we did so by uh, thinking about all we could do right now, which is we were allowed to go on our daily walk. Um, and from that, we created a series of tasks, which we set to our team. Uh, go on your daily walk, stop, listen, and then tell me what you heard. Uh, go on a daily walk, uh, stop, get home and write, free write what you noticed, what you sought, and then um, go on your daily walk and talk to us for 10 minutes. So we recorded these lovely little recordings. And when that came together, we realised that we had created something part diary, part drama, that kind of followed on um, a bit of a meditation almost. So we noticed at the beginning, people were very much talking about, here we are going on my walk. These are the practicalities of how I leave my house. Um, and then as people started to talk, a lot of the anxieties around lockdown came out. So what it felt like, the rules around how to go on your walk safely, how we interact with strangers that walk past us in the street, um, the, the, the slalom of this lockdown, the slalom of crossing the road. Um, and what we noticed was that as people began to walk, that act of walking and that pacing released something else and released a chance to think about renewal and the opportunities that this provided and a sense of space to breathe and finding um, finding a new way of being and existing. And we um, created it from our various locations. So from Manchester, Marple, um, Walpole in Suffolk, Brighton um, and, uh, and Bucks as well. And um, some of us living in cities, some of us living in villages. And then we devised over Zoom. So we came together with the material that we created. From that, we'd synthesised some kind of libretto or text to start with. And a lot of it was devised by Michael playing a vamp, us having a listen, us all getting our phones out and recording ourselves singing over the vamp and then sending those off to him. And from that, again, he's created this beautiful piece um, featuring our, our harmonies and suggestions. So um, that is Walk Out of Yourself. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Freya, for your uh, final words there. And I think that's a good starting point. Um, the way you were talking about you, how you you brought it all together, fresh ideas, and actually with very little kind of um, uh, sense of, of having to be restricted by what we usually understand by as, as, as opera. And I think that's the, the most amazing thing about watching all these videos. There's such a huge variety of approaches from things that we might recognize as being operatic in the traditional sense to whole new approaches, um, things that are maybe more reminiscent of, of the euphoric atmosphere of, of, of pop videos or um, Frey, your pieces, it kind of turns into this amazing kind of pastoral symphony almost at the end. Um, and I'm just thinking, as a first question, I mean, how important is it to try and define what an opera is? And did you feel all oh, that it was an amazing opportunity to actually push the boundaries of what that definition um, might be? Shall I, go, shall I go first? <laughs> I think as a company, that's what we've been trying to do. That's what we really um, believe in. And I know that's definitely one of the challenges we've faced in trying to get work commissioned is when you kind of straddle these disciplines. It can be quite a difficult place. A lot of us work as opera educators. And I think we feel really passionately that 
for the next generation of opera makers. We need to really investigate and interrogate what opera should be and who it's for. And um, I know that we use verbatim technique. We, we, we very deliberately um, try and explore the boundaries and still call it opera because I think it's a really important conversation and a debate that we're um, really up for having and really up for kind of challenging and, and asking the right questions about. Um, but it does definitely pose pose its its issues I think but um definitely something we're keen to to challenge yeah, I'm really interested in um is is good storytelling and I think the ability that Ella and Opera Harmony and Opera Vision have provided us here is a chance to be very au courant with our storytelling and to reach and touch people uh, where they are immediately. I think all of the pieces that, that we saw today address that. And that was the power that I wanted to play with, with Wisdom of Stone, was um, immediately speaking to the heart of where we are now. Um, I adore opera in all its forms, but Traviata doesn't speak to me in the now. And so I think that pertinence and the relevance that each piece brought in the storytelling was a really important uh, step forward for all of us in, in opera and in sharing with the world that new work is wonderful and equally worthy uh, to traditional repertoire. Yeah, Harry? J just a, a sort of flip side of that in a way, just from our experience, we we had this amazing poetry really was our first kind of version of a, of a libretto it was quite abstract poetry and we had a few conversations about really okay how do we carve this into a story um thinking in that kind of operatic mindset of okay how would you stage it what what is the story how do we tell this and actually what was really nice over time as as the project developed was to realize that whatever it was in this quite abstract poetic form would actually serve quite nicely. And if, if say, the, the video element had a more storytelling um, approach, but that the, the lyrical side of things was quite abstract, that that is quite nice and we and we we weren't bound too much by okay well let's let's tell a very clear story we were quite happy for people to kind of um interpret that 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 um visual kind of side of things as they wanted which was kind of a nice realization i guess yeah i mean i think it's one of the amazing things that comes across is actually how much richness of of meaning there is through the restrictions of not being able to show everything through the time restrictions as well. You, there are so many gaps left, which then the, the viewers have to fill in for, for themselves. And I think, I mean, a particularly good example or as an obvious example is Judith, your, your piece where obviously it's a dialogue, but one person partaking in the dialogue is, is um, not presented in a traditional way, I guess. <laughs> it was, it was a playoff of one another's ideas and it, and it felt so natural and organic to work together and despite the fact that we were so far apart. Um, so that was one of the elements that I was so impressed with about how this all worked. When we had never met before and you would think we would have so little in common. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, uh, and another another very interesting thing is just the different um, reactions to Ella's original um, call to arms. Um, it's quite a broad brief, and um, some people. Um, I mean, Christopher, I'm thinking of your 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 piece. It's actually very Corona specific <laughs> in a way, and. Um, I think to treat it with such um, humour, it reminded me almost of uh, kind of Hansel and Gretel um, taking taking up arms against the, the grown up world. Um, was that an inspiration of sorts, or was it just um, your own fantasy that went went crazy there? Yeah, we did talk about Hansel and Gretel a little bit in the process, but. Um... What really inspired me initially was uh, walking through, um, well, I teach in a school, I teach piano, and this was pre-lockdown, and I was walking through the playground, and this was 
in the weeks before lockdown where we didn't really know what was going to happen in the next couple of months and just hearing what the children were saying about it all and how they were you know running around saying oh i'm uh, i'm gonna shoot you with some coronavirus la, 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 la. And, and you know just really getting it all wrong and some of them had it all right and i, I, I was inspired by the by their take on it and um yeah just a desire to really inject some humor into the sort of atmosphere that we had at the time then so everything was doom and gloom and it was very serious and i remember talking to the uh, writer fiona williams about this there was no humor at all where were the where were the jokes and i i, I know that there's a it was a it's it's been a very hard year but um we wanted to make something like hard and I, and i hope that we that we did that and gave people a bit of fun along the way um talking about uh, the more comic side of things mary um apart mental kind of fits into that category i'd say as well and i think you probably win the prize for coming up with the most ingenious solution for not uh, for people not being able to be there in the same place with your amazing um designs there um could you yeah i mean maybe say something a bit more about the the inspiration behind behind that and how how that all came together yeah um so uh and judith i echo your praise of the ingenious and amazing anna pool who is like was every part of the reason why the aesthetic kind of came together as it as it did which is that uh, my best friend is a children's book illustrator and she i was kind of moaning about not being very inspired during covid and so as a lark she drew up all of the characters um in the piece and i sent her i sent her the sort of character descriptions and they're all characters actually who live in my building in new york city um and they're people i run into all the time and sophia is the concierge and you know david this photographer character lives next door and it's all just like very clear true to life and jojo drew up all these people and uh and i showed them to anna and i made a little teaser trailer and Anna was like, well, that's our aesthetic right there. That's the easiest thing to do and get Jojo to make backgrounds for everybody. And she went there and I, we, we just kind of went with it. It was very organic. Um, it's been an interesting after process because the comments on the thread of the YouTube view are like really hard to get out of your head as a creator. It's almost like hilarious criticism from people you don't know. Um, and I would say that it, I think it's the kind of thing that you love it or you hate it like right away and you really respond to the aesthetic and the shaky camera thing that I was going for. Um, but the aesthetic was born out of those puppets and also my own upbringing in the 80s and sort of 80 TV show filming um, and what, what that was like. So uh, yeah, it was really, it was also Chris, Christopher, when you said the desire to make people laugh and the sort of absurdity of all of this. Um, I think for some people like me, it has made me laugh a lot thinking about all of the sort of different various aspects of like who actually stole the wipes, which is an actual thing that happened in my building. So the, the sort of ridiculousness, there were posters posted everywhere like, thief, like stop thief, um, but also that it's this serious thing where like somebody could pass away from this disease. But, you know, I think that our goal as artists is to provoke and so mission accomplished. Thank you. I need to check out some of those comments. Um, we've already touched a little bit when, when everyone was introducing their pieces about the challenges of, of, um, of the filming, of the performing, um, of bringing everything together. And I want to bring in um, uh, Franco and, 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 and Daisy here a little bit because you were both performing on your videos and Daisy already touched about the, touched on the difficulties of um, finding someone to film it for you. Um, so I was wondering if you could say something a bit more about that and then maybe Franco something about how different it is for you as, a, as a, an operatic performer to perform in a project like this compared with what you, you usually do? Yeah, so for me, it was a, it was kind of an amazingly empowering experience because it would never have happened had lockdown not happened and everything that, you know, everything that we had to go through. And um, I actually filmed it all myself, except for the very final dance scene. And that in itself was mad because I've never used a camera to film anything before and suddenly I'm DOPing this thing with Ella very much directing me. And so 
I would sort of take the my phone up onto you know wherever I was going in my white nighty um with people walking around the south downs like okay um and I'd get a bit of footage and then I'd come back and Ella and I would have a conversation and then Ella would say okay but can you now take it out and do this and I was sort of getting better and better at setting up the shots every time that we did that sometimes I was literally holding it sometimes I was setting up the shot um and you know what actually I found it, it is what it is and I sh- I edited it on my iPhone on iMovie which was unbelievably hard um because I didn't have a up to scratch enough laptop to uh to do it there and um but I just found it really empowering because it kind of meant that we could just keep on getting footage and keep on going and keep on pushing and keep on exploring as this kind of as we were also building the productional side of the music um I wasn't singing live so I had already recorded the song so I was lucky from that perspective and then um and then yeah and then just sort of when we did realize oh we need this dance moment then it was like okay I can't film that and the way to film dance you need quite a lot of different shots um to make it look you know to make it work and to breathe and to move in the way that it it needs to on film and so yeah that that was just really cool to then I think when you're limited suddenly I don't know the 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 sort of how you can just sort of fix problems that you thought were were an issue like okay how am I going to film that in a lockdown scenario um is there anyone in this village this tiny little village and it turns out that yeah there's this young videographer who does weddings and had lost all of his work and kind of he came down and turns out he was brilliant um so yeah (laughs) and Franco how was it for you to be performing in what must be quite an unusual way compared with how you usually how you usually do it yeah and i i uh it was it was difficult for me um uh, i i feel like i'm a bit of a dinosaur because first of all i i have an old blackberry that i still use you know and um and i had no tripods or or um uh, any kind of devices that, that i think a lot of people have um we got together uh, right away and had a meeting after uh, after the uh, Ella put together the cast. And it, it really interesting because I had just finished uh, Ellie Weisel's book, At Night, which is a very similar uh, tale of, of survival from Auschwitz and on the death march. And all of a sudden she has this piece for me and uh, um, she put together a great cast. And um, so Robert Hersey, the director, he, he, he's, he got a meeting and we all uh, got together and he gave us some initial blocking things. And um, uh, then we got a, a, a rough, uh, a rough uh, line. Uh, Philip wrote this score in two days, which uh, it just blew me away. Uh, it's really, really complicated, really beautiful lyric lyrical music and um so there was a rough there was a rough cut which we did the recording uh thing and that was hard enough but then to try to line everything up and and uh try to go after what um robert wanted i was really driving me crazy and trying to get the right place in the house and without noise and without the phones ringing and the, the the traffic going by and um, and so I had a few things going and then I saw like Roger and and Susie were sending in clips and I thought, wow, I'm going to really have to up my game. They, they are putting together some really interesting shots. So I got my mother and I got my brother and we went out and we started finding locations and and just creating mood things. And, you know, I'm sending I'm sending Robert hundreds and hundreds of clips because he's just said send me everything send me everything and his brother is a, a very fine editor and um and he put this he, we just it just kept layering and layering and getting more and more enriched every edit every cut um you know there were things in the sound that i wish were different but like uh it it, it just uh, it's kind of a, the beautiful rawness of the limitations we are in because I'm in Chicago. We have a singer in uh, Ireland and uh, Philip was in Scotland, although he's from Czechoslovakia. And uh, uh, we had another 
uh, person in up up north England and and uh, one in um, Scot another singer in Scotland too. So I mean it was trying to come together and then and we kept having meetings and we talk and it was it was really a joyful cast and in fact after the uh, after the premiere on um, on Opera Vision, thank you very much. We had an opening night party, so we we all had a little cocktails and got our champagne out and we had a mini uh, Zoom party opening night party which was just delightful and I, I hope I get to uh, get a chance to meet everybody in person because other than Carolyn who I've, I've worked with uh, once I have not worked with any of the other people before. Just wanting to pick up quickly on that beautiful rawness that Franco was talking about. I will say it's something that I found so wonderful. This was such a liberating experience because if you think about it, you know, the idea of making a movie, recording it in our own homes, we would never have allowed ourselves to do that. We would never have believed it was going to be good enough. And yet in this time of lockdown, suddenly it was possible and it was allowed and lo-fi was accepted and welcomed. And I think we found that the most, the most liberating thing, I think the permission to just make work. And I think that's something that I will use a lot more now, this feeling that it's allowed to just make work and put it out. And it doesn't have to have been shot by someone with years of experience. It can be edited by someone who's never done it before. And, um, and I think really early on, uh, when I when we all decided we were going to film things, the first thing I was saying to everyone was, this doesn't need to be perfect. You're doing this on your mobile phones at a, an extreme time when you can't even get a friend to come and film you in your in your house if you live on your own in your house. Um, and as a result of that, this doesn't need to be perfect. Let it be raw, that idea of that rawness. And from that, some of the footage that I looked at and originally I thought, oh, I can't use that. It's just far too shaky or it, it's too quick moving. Suddenly you'd find like the most perfect moment. And when I was editing this, I didn't necessarily have the, the hugest oversight of what I was going to make. I was just exploring the footage and these these surprises what kept happening, these accidents kept happening where it zoomed in too much or, or I suddenly noticed a peacock in Rob's garden um, when he's trying to film his bit and suddenly his peacock walks past and that suddenly became a huge feature of our piece and it was the accidental timings of just having to do this in our own home with our baby making noises while we're going for a walk or all of those accidents that made it um, that yeah that beautiful rawness I just think and and so liberating and um, I think that will really impact how we as a company continue to, to make work and that we'll seize upon that. So thanks. Reflecting on what, on what Freya and Franco are saying, I think something that was an amazing takeaway for all of us was the, the phrase, we're all in this together, we've all heard it, but all of a sudden I felt it. Um, the international quality and the fact that everyone had to gather friends and family around in our situation in Wisdom of Stone, uh, Anne Sophie was recording some samples for us, but she's singing in a stone building. So the acoustic was um, a little live to say the least. And so she had to put herself into a, into a bed with tapestries and cushions all around her to make the recording. And then there were tour buses and children and dogs, and she's trying to do it herself on her phone. Um, but then her family started to film. And I thought how wonderful that was that they were doing something that they'd never done before together. Um, and to that end, she also created one of the props, the, um, the plague mask, the black plague mask. She crafted that out of uh, chicken wire that was hanging about her garden um, because she wanted to have something there. So I think the permission that you've talked about Freya for all of us to just say, all right, just go for this. You know, this is uncharted water and um, we're all explorers finding new worlds. It's, it's so luscious. Right, and somebody mentioned last week to or our last call, but um, you know, getting my mother and my brother involved and they, they're not artists, they don't, they're not creatives, but you know, getting my mother holding the camera and shaking and she goes, when do I go? Do I go now? And and uh, and so we do it. We do the scene. Then we do it. Is that? It's like, mom, don't talk. Just stop right there and just let's do it again. And don't say anything. And say okay. And then her fingers in the way of the the camera lens. And uh, 
but it was a it, it was she had a great time and then uh, um like Freya was saying with the peacock, I, we had this, I had seen one, we're out with my brother, and all of a sudden we're right by the train tracks, and this train is coming, and I just like had to like go out there now, get and run out there, and I just walked along the, walked along the edge of the train tracks as this, this train came powering by, and it was uh, really, Robert was able to use it in the, uh, in the, in the film, and it was a very effective moment, so yeah, just those kind of uh, unknown, uh, you know, stream of consciousness, little miracles that pop up in the in 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 the in the moment. We had a similar um, accident with when I was composing the Den. Um, one of uh, the singers, Britt Hewitt, who's playing Joe, she has a cat, a really cute cat that was kept on scuttling in front of the camera, and that ended up becoming a bit of a main character in our in our story, which was. <laughs> totally unplanned but um really um added to the aesthetic but what was what i interestingly found with this project was that i mean at the end of the day the end product was a film rather than uh, simply a live performance in the traditional sense so there were added technical difficulties in that regard certainly when it came to um all the fast editing that we had to do with um with the den i found that i had to speed a lot of clips up and slow them down sometimes by like about five percent here or there just to get them to fit in um into the into the bar or the beat which and, and the score the actual music was was strictly strictly that it couldn't get any faster or, or any slower because the singers had already sung their parts the musicians had played their parts so getting the the film and footage to fit in the score was a real challenge I just wanted to have a moment to give a shout out to uh, the amazing Will Liverman, the baritone who was in Mary's piece as well as mine. And um, just to let everyone know that he memorized that piece. It was almost 10 minutes and, and learned it quickly. And you know, had this, I thought, beautiful emotional landscape portrayal of it and, and as an actor and a singer. And so I felt that it was really a tour de force and I just wanted to say how amazing he is. And then somebody had asked me about why we use the Sistine Chapel image at the end for our credits and just wanted to, briefly just say along the lines of, of what Freya was saying and so forth, things are, certain decisions are kind of made in the moment. And we felt like that it was metaphoric and timely, whether it's Adam and God or it's grandchild and a grandparent in the COVID-19 era, we can't touch, we long for physical closeness. We're bereft and at this poignant image of sort of iconic artwork was to speak to our loneliness and isolation and our intense longing for connection. So. I, I wanted to bring Ella in as well. Um, oh. I was just about to say something anyway. Okay, good. <laughs> I, I think out of this thing, what everyone's been saying is obviously they're talking about the, the family sort of effort where people created a new sense of community in, in making these works and also our audiences. We've suddenly been able to share for the first time, especially because I've got family abroad, we've been able to share our works with anyone and everyone and also the other really unique thing about this is the fact that we were never trained in these skills. We we all learn about making live theatre and we will always love live theatre. Nothing will, nothing will ever change that and we will want to keep on doing that. But we've learned to adapt and be able to still keep on creating in this time. And just I've been so astonished by the skills and the quality of the execution of everyone's videos after watching a lot of I got a bit of the sort of zoom fatigue after a while actually of watching quite a lot of things that look the same but everything every single piece was so unique and it was all so different and varied and you know it was it was so wonderful what these guys learned and made and and they threw everyone threw themselves into it in such a everyone was so positive and hopefully these people will now have new connections for life and new friends and maybe they'll actually all meet each other one day i've met a lot of them in reality but not everyone I mean, I think it's amazing to go back to this 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 um, this idea of, of things being rough and ready, not having to be polished, just being authentic and being done in whatever way is possible within the restrictions. It's amazing when you think um, about all this creativity that you've unleashed for this project, Ella, and then compare that with um, the usual institutions that kind of are the gatekeepers of opera in a way where the, the opera houses where, I mean, I'm a big fan, obviously, of opera houses, <laughs> um, where 
uh, things are rehearsed for, for, for weeks and it's about achieving this level of professionalism and perfection. Um, but the opera houses have been struggling to come up with some way of reacting to, to the, this whole era um, and the challenges um, imposed by, by COVID. But at the same time, you've been able to unleash this whole kind of um, new world of operatic creation that isn't um, kind of held back by, by the expectations that I think there always were before, before COVID kicked in. Um, do you, I, do you think, I, I think this is kind of the way ahead for opera in a way? I think opera is changing at the moment and it's at the moment, at least for the foreseeable future, it's going to be a mixture of live and online as with it, until there's a vaccine, we just, however we try to get back to live performance, it's going to be in an elastic way where there's going to have to be plans A, B, C to Z, basically. Um, so I think something like this, you know, actually equips people with a lot of skills that they can carry forwards. And I think maybe even now people might want to in incorporate more more kind of online elements into live performances. I think it's certainly shown that um, no matter what the opera house is, no matter where the opera house is, there are ways to, and I know Opera Vision already do this with the streaming, but I think there's definitely, you know, it's really brought to the fore that actually audiences anywhere in the world can be, can be, you can be in any theatre, you really can. There's no reason not to be included. It's also worth pointing out that musically, the um, putting opera on, um, online and having it in this digital domain gives you, uh, com um, as a composer, sometimes more musical um, forces at your command. So for instance, with my piece, I was able to have 50 different percussion parts and I wouldn't be able to have 50 different percussionists in real life. And I was, I was able to um, play something in and then make it faster or slower to an in inhuman degree. And that, I guess that suited the aesthetic of my piece, which was meant to be very revved up. Um, you might not, not necessarily want that, but it, it just meant that I could do more with, with, with the electronics in that regard. So I'm hoping that maybe what we can maybe get in future in the live performance um, uh, stage is just some more influence of electronics and, and maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe the, maybe the online and digital world can offer the live performance something kind of new way to think about things in that regard who knows and what's fascinating as well is the way of course film has had to be introduced into these operas i mean it could only happen really with film and with staged opera we've seen film introduced in various ways over the years and it's never quite it's, it's rarely worked terribly well but suddenly and it is a, it is like a new genre this, these these video operas that have unleash this amazing um, creativity. I just wanted to say on that actually, like I'm an opera fraud, you know, I'm definitely not, I don't, you know, I, I'm not an opera singer, I'm an actor and and I write music. And um, for me, this has been really amazing because like you were just saying, Hugo, like I, I was embraced into something and welcomed into something that I would never have entered <laughs> into. Um, and I think as a creative, I have found something where two, two of my things that I do very separately have come together. And this sort of what you were talking about at the start of this whole session, like uh, storytelling and, and, and when is it opera? And I am not the person to say that you are much more the experts than I am. But the fact that I was welcomed to be a part of that, that I kind of create this song and it's part of a, a bigger show that Ella and I um, uh, intend to put on later down the line, whenever that's possible. And um, I, I, I found a role within this landscape, whatever that means, but it does feel like something new and different, um, being sort of a huge fan of opera and being a performer as an actor and a writer and performer as a musician. It's sort of, that's been really, really liberating and, and really awesome to be part of. Thank you, Daisy. And I think um, that's a great um, thought to be ending on. And I just want to hand over to um, to Luca Shaughnessy from Opera Europa to say a few final words about the project. Uh, look, thank you all very much for this really uh, 
fascinating discussion. Um, I indeed work for, for Opera Europa, which is a network of opera houses. Um, those, those gatekeepers you've been talking about, Hugo, and I think uh, this whole project with the, the, the wave of creativity that's, that's hit us, um, thanks to you guys over the, the month of August, um, has really sent a strong message to our um, uh, our partner opera houses um, to, to think differently. Um, and uh, if you're watching this video now in 2020, uh, opera houses take, take note. And if you're watching this video in 2050, um, note these faces around this Zoom <laughs> because um, they were been really instrumental. Um, and our biggest thanks, of course, goes to Ella Marshman, who's who's brainchild this is um talk, talking about um oh lots of thumbs up um talking about sort of traditional game gatekeepers it, it, it's it's completely inappropriate for now for me to tell you that that of course you're all in competition with each other because in in a very old world simplistic way um we we made this into a little competition um which which seems um almost inappropriate but the gatekeepers are the general public um, and now uh, in, in the end of 1st of September 2020, we, we now give the public the opportunity to say their word about the, the, the operas that you created that tickled them most. So um, for our Opera Vision viewing public right now, um, they have the chance to say, um, say their word. Um, how cruel of me to bring that up as the last thing. Uh, anyway, it, it, for what is worth, uh, thank you, um, Hugo, and thank you to all the participants um, in this chat, and um, our opera houses will be taking note, I think. Hi, this is Nicholas again. And sorry about that. Uh, we are, uh, the Zoom is off air. We are on the final images and the live streams are going to stop in a few seconds. Thank you everyone for a very fluent conversation. It was very clear for me to do, to do what, when, all the clips played out perfectly, I think. I think so. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a successful evening. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, You're guys. That was really good fun. Thank you.